Hi, this is Sue Glenn. We are going to be talking about competition some more with uh, some more examples of experiments uh, in relation to the niche of the species. So we've already talked about uh, the uh, Latkovatera competition models and uh, we've talked about the uh, concept of the niche and the fundamental niche and the realized niche in previous videos. Uh, I'm Sue Glenn, this is for Ecology Class and we are basing uh, these examples from the ones that are in the textbook by Moles and Scher which is Ecology Concepts and Applications 8th edition which was published by uh, McGraw-Hill in 2019. And that is a kangaroo rat, which we will be talking about a little bit later. We'll start off with a, a very old experiment that was done by uh, Sir Tansley in Britain in, in uh, 1917. And he was looking at these common weeds, uh, bed straws, and uh, two species, one that was grown on um, more alkaline calcareous limestone soils, that is Gallium sylvestra, and the other one was Gallium saxatile, which uh, grew on more acidic soils. And uh, he suggested that interspecific competition uh, restricts the uh, realized niche, niche of these two species to a narrower range of soils and that they could actually live in the different soils. Here's a picture of, of him, and uh, these are the results of uh, his experiment. Uh, he was looking at the germination of seeds on the different soils, and he found that on the acidic soils, you found uh, the germination of the saxatile, which are the orange bars, uh, was only slightly elevated from its germination on the basic soil. Um, and the sylvestra uh, seeds could germinate on both soils as well. Uh, so they could germinate in both places. And uh, so it is possible that they could uh, survive in both places. So he did some experiments where he grew each species by itself and then he grew them together. So the black dots are showing you uh, the sylvestra uh, species and the white dots are showing you the saxatile. So in the top one you can see on both the limestone calcareous soils on the left in orange and the acidic soils on the right in purple and we can see that the uh, saxatile uh, could grow in both places uh, but it really you know uh, grew the best in the acidic soil but it can its fundamental niche includes both soils. Sylvester, the same thing. It grew best on the calcareous soil, but it could also grow on the acidic soil. So its fundamental niche is both as well. Um, and then when you planted them together, you could see uh, on the calcareous soil, the limestone soil, the Sylvester overgrew and eliminated the saxatile, which is the acidic soil species, and vice versa on the acidic soil. So he was using experiments to look at the influence of interspecific competition on the niches of these species, and he was showing that competition was an important mechanism that organized the uh, communities, and that the fundamental niche of both species included both soil types, and, and that we only found them each on one soil type because of this competition. We've talked about barnacles before, and uh, we talked about Balanus and Tothalmus. Uh, which were in these uh, very predictable and uh, very clear bands as we went through the intertidal zone so that you would find in the upper intertidal zone you'd find uh, Tothamus and then in the middle to lower intertidal zone you'd find the Bolinus. And, uh, and so this is a, looking at an experiment where they actually removed Bolinus um, from the uh, from the area, uh, and uh, so those on the on the graphs on the right here, we have the years and the survival of Chthalmus, and we can see the the blue line across here is when they removed Bolinus, and the red line is is where Bolinus was present, and this is looking up in this upper intertidal zone, and whether you take it away or not doesn't seem to make much difference to the Chathomus. The Chathomus is still uh, growing quite uh, plentifully uh, 
and and the surviving in that upper intertidal zone. But when you look at the um, middle intertidal zone, so we're looking uh, lower down where it gets less uh, exposed, um, removing the balanus made a huge difference. So we can see the uh, where the balanus was taken away, the blue line across here, uh, the chithalmus could actually live down there. So when we took it away, the chithalmus was uh, able to do much better. Uh, the red line is where the, the balanus is, is present. So we can see that in removing it, uh, we're, we're, we're really having a big effect on um, in competition. So in that middle intertidal zone, the competition with the um, the balanus is what's keeping Chithalmus out of that area. And remember up here in this upper intertidal zone, it was the drying out that was um, keeping the balanus from living up in that point. But in this zone here, it's competition. Up here, it's drying out and desiccation. And then lower down, they can't survive because everybody tries to eat them when they're down in the lower water. This is a study looking at competition and the different niches of small rodents living in the Chihuahuan Desert in New Mexico. And this was work done by Jim Brown and uh, students and colleagues. And they predicted that if competition among the rodents is mainly for food, then the small granivorous rodents, so the ones that the little tiny mice that are eating the seeds, would increase if they took out one of the bigger ones. And the bigger one they would take out would be the kangaroo rat. If they took that out of the system, then the little rodents uh, would have less competition and they would respond and become more plentiful. Um, as a control, they added in uh, also looking at the insectivorous rodents uh, to see if they would have a response because uh, they would predict that it wouldn't, if competition was for food was what was going on, the guys that ate, ate, in, that ate insects shouldn't care whether or not uh, you were taking out the kangaroo rats, the guys that were to eating grains. Um, and uh, the results really did support their hypotheses. So let's take a look at what they did. This is a kind of an amazing experiment. So they had this huge area, uh, and you should read up on what their experimental design was um, and how they had to make sure that they were not finding um, confounding factors. For example, this is looking at an area photograph of their plots out in the desert. And uh, you can see that there are all these big square plots. When you put fencing down, that's changing the environment. So the environment around a fenced area is going to have shading from the fencing itself that's going to affect the types of plants that are growing there in the temperature and then uh, you could have birds coming and sitting on top of these fences and they're going to put droppings down and that's also going to uh, affect uh, the type of vegetation and then you might have predatory birds sitting up here that might be eating your rodents so you had ha had to have some places with fences that were actually uh, letting things come and go because you had a fence effect and other times um, you could just have the fences that were keeping things from coming and going. So these were 50 by 50 meter study plots and they were a very fine uh, fence that was mouse proof. And they had to dig it down 20 centimeters into the soil so the mice couldn't dig under it. And uh, so then the mice were climbing over them so they had to put aluminum flashing around the top to keep the mice from coming going over it. And then they cut holes in the fencing. So they put holes that were six and a half centimeters in diameter on all sides of the fences. And when they did that, that allowed everybody to come and go. So they were going in and out and in and out. And they monitored what was just the natural number so they, they could you know see it doesn't matter if we had the fences or not. Since we have the fences there, make sure there's not going to be an impact of the fences. Let's just see who's coming in and out of our study plots. And then when they uh, had done that initial monitoring, so this is like a control period where they haven't removed anybody. Then uh, they took uh, for four of the plots, 
uh, they went and uh, so these are half the plots. They reduced the, the size of the holes down to less than two centimeters. So when they did that, that was excluding the kangaroo rat, the Depotamus. Um, but at the same time, the little guys were still free to come and go and come and go. But when they went into these fenced areas where the big guy couldn't go, all of a sudden, in these four plots, they would have uh, enough, uh, they would have all the food to themselves. They weren't competing with the larger granivore. Whereas in the other four plots, um, the big guy could still go in there and eat the food. They did this experiment more than once, so you can see that there are more than eight study plots in total. All right, here we have the data. So when we take a look at the data, we've got um, three graphs kind of piled up on top of one another here. And the top one is showing us the kangaroo rat population. And so the green uh, dots are the control plots. That's where kangaroo rats could get in and out of the plots. Um, the, the kangaroo rats were the big granivores, so they're the big competitor. And then uh, the red plots, uh, the red dots are where they had uh, reduced the holes in the fences down to a size that was too small for the kangaroo rats to get in. And here you have to actually still monitor to make sure you are actually removing kangaroo rats just in case they find another way in. So you can see a few of them snuck in a few years here and there, but for the most part, they were able to um, keep out the big, the big competitor. Then the second graph is showing you uh, the same uh, plots. So the green ones are the control plots where you have the kangaroo rats and the red ones are the removal plots where the kangaroo rats were removed. And we can see that uh, the numbers of small granivores increased when you removed the kangaroo rats. So that that is definitely showing you that uh, the the kangaroo rats were competing with these guys, and uh, and once the kangaroo rats were eliminated, then the uh, small granivores, the little mice, were doing just fine. The very bottom one, these are your insectivorous guys, and we can see it didn't make any difference to them uh, whether or not you removed the the kangaroo rats or not, because you can see uh, they're just basically following the same pattern uh, year after year. So this was another control uh, where you're making sure that uh, uh, you're looking at competition for grain because these guys are eating something completely different. So we're really looking at feeding niches. And here they are, you can see them grabbing grabbing a little, uh, well, a rather large, <laughs> uh, nasty looking insect so that uh, they, that's where their main food source is. Um, Doing this, you worry maybe there was something different between these control plots and these removal plots initially uh, before we uh, started collecting the data. And maybe there were in general uh, fewer or more, more of the small granivores in that particular set of plots. So they did it again. Uh, that's the next one. So uh, here they are they're removing a kangaroo rat right there. Um, the kangaroo rats are pretty big. And so uh, here you can see we've got exactly the same years across the bottom. But in this case, they have data from the plots for all these years until they removed the kangaroo rats in 1988. So instead of removing the, the kangaroo rats over here in 1977, they're removing them uh, much later. So then they can show you that, yes, the, these uh, two sets of plots were pretty much the same as far as kangaroo rats. They were pretty much the same as far as the little mice and definitely the same as far as the insectivorous uh, rodents. Uh, but after the removal, kangaroo rats are gone. And after the removal, you can see a difference in the uh, numbers of the, the small granivores uh, following the removal of the big granivores. So we can see the effect here. And yet you didn't see any difference in your insectivore. So uh, we can see that uh, doing the experiment twice, I uh, gave them more data so they were able to show that the plots were the same to start with. 
So we see that competitive interactions could be strong and long lasting, and it could pr produce an evolutionary response in the competitor. Uh, it's really uh, taking one species and pushing it into its realized niche, niche, and that the longer it spends in its realized niche, the ones that are surviving are the ones that are best adapted to that subset of the environment. And over time, it can mean that that's the environment that is becomes its fundamental niche, so that at that point, it is um, uh, uh, changing in an evolutionary time, changing the fundamental niche. So because uh, competition is dependent on um, basically eliminating uh, the individuals that are overlapping with another species niche, uh, this means that you can uh, be pushing species uh, characteristics apart from each other, uh, away from this area where they overlap. So that, that is directional selection. Um, so if this something else is eating the same food as you, uh, you're the ones of your population that are going to survive are the ones that are eating a slightly different food and has the characters that are associated with getting that slightly different food. So it's really hard to study this. Um, and so they talk a little bit about in this section of the chapter about uh, some of the characteristics are required for you to actually study character displacement. It's obviously going to take a long period of time to see this. Um, and, uh, and you really want places where the species are living apart and places where the species are living together so you can see the differences. So that's where we're dealing with allopatric and sympatric uh, distributions and it's hard to find that and then uh, and then uh, trying to come up with an experimental design where you have some that are living apart some living together um, that we know that uh, the character displacement or the characteristics are associated with the, the feeding or whatever aspect of the niche it is and that they're uh, actually controlled by the genetics very difficult to find a place to set all this up. Oh, but look, we had a place. Uh, these are the Galapagos finches. You should be familiar now with the Galapagos Islands and know where the Galapagos Islands are off the coast of South America in the Pacific Ocean. And here we can find islands where we have two species of Galapagos finches um, that are living uh, apart from each other. So we have uh, little islands where we have uh, Geospiza fortis um, on uh, living by themselves. And we can see that the distribution, they have this range of beak sizes. And then we can see the Geospiza uh, fuliginosa. Uh, it's living by itself over here. And you can see its uh, range of beak sizes. And so if we were to look at these beak sizes um, in the fuliginosus, it overlaps the beak sizes in this range. Maybe you can't see that. Let me try that with a different color in that range right there. And when we find the two species living together right here on Santa Cruz Island, uh, we find that their beak sizes are different. Um, the Fortis uh, finches will have beak sizes that uh, extend into a much larger sizes and the bulk of the um, fuliginosa beaks are going to have extended down into these smaller sizes. So they are really avoiding the beak sizes where these things are going to be in direct competition with each other. So you can see how over time that would lead to uh, character displacement and evolutionary change. So characters of displacement and necessary uh, criteria include that you have to have uh, morphological differences uh, between the species that are living together that are greater than 
than the populations that are isolated. The differences have to be genetic. They have to evolved in place, not that they um, had just the ones with the small beaks ended up on this island and the ones with the big beaks ended up on that island. Um, we It has to have some... Uh, some sort of attribute that is uh, useful for using the resources. It has to demonstrate that you have competition for resources that relates to that and that you can't explain it by uh, differences in the resources on the two islands so the, so, or on the different islands. You'd have to have all the same resources available to them. It's really hard to meet all of these criteria. And where did that happen? It happened in the Galapagos Islands. Um, and uh, Darwin saw this and saw these differences. And it just triggered things in his mind about how natural selection works as a mechanism for evolution. And uh, because this was such a unique place where you could see this happening, it became clear to him that uh, this would be something to uh, follow up on and uh, led to his writing of the, the book, The Evolution of Species by Natural Selection. When you're uh, going through uh, these ideas, this is a, a, this competition chapter we've been talking about for the last few presentations. Uh, well, there's a lot of material in this. You certainly got your money's worth. Um, think about how mathematical theory, lab models, and field experiments contribute to our understanding of competition. Um, what are the advantages and disadvantages of each of these uh, approaches to it? So some of, the, some of them have uh, different disadvantages and some of them have uh, different advantages. This other question lists the environmental circumstances in which you think intraspecific and intraspecific competition would most likely occur in nature. How would you go about testing your ideas? If you were going out into a forest, how would you test the idea if uh, interspecific or intraspecific competition were the stronger forces? And uh, what would you think would be uh, the strongest force uh, going out into different environments? We've talked about in this chapter, we've talked about uh, resource comp comp competition and, and different modes of competition. Uh, we've talked about uh, intraspecific and interspecific competition and the niche and the uh, importance of the concept of the niche and uh, competitive exclusion when we're dealing with this. We went into a lot of detail on the Lotka-Volterra competition model. This is a basis for so many other models in ecology and also used outside of ecology that it's really important that you understand that. Um, and, uh, and then talked about some of the lab models testing that, the assumptions of that, th those, that theory. And then we talked about this uh, competition, uh, changing the niches and, and character displacement and the evolutionary impacts of that. So there's been a lot in this chapter. For homework, you should be able to answer the concept review questions at the ends of the chapters and the review questions at the end of the um entire chapter. Also take a look in the Appendix A in this textbook, Investigating the Evidence. Uh, there's one on field experiments and there were really good field experiments in this chapter. So make sure that you are uh, familiar with that. Next up, we're going to be talking about other exploitive interactions uh, where one species is benefiting from uh, another species that it's hurting. Uh, and uh, this will include a lot of Voltaire predator prey relationships. So we're, we're adding in another aspect to our models. So we will hopefully be able to see you there at the next, next talk.